Today on Low Buck Garage, I do some work on my rear axle. There's a lot of chunks of things in here. I do some work in the dashboard. Not sure if that's an upgrade. I don't do some work on the exterior. So I'm going to solve this problem by ignoring it. And then this happens. You've seen my old shop truck in previous videos. I did a bit of work on it. Let me recap that real fast. I got the truck after it had been rolled over, so it needed a little bit of body work. I started with the cab. Well, I'll still have to deal with the bed. As usual, I just made it up as I went along and just kind of put things together. And then added steps and some storage. A little interior work, and I called it good enough. Oh, I could take a nap now. But that was quite a few years ago. And quite a few things have happened since then. It's time for an update. And now I've used it for a while. A couple things I noted. The drawers down here. These drawers are super useful. I keep all sorts of stuff in there. I love these full length steps. Bed access is great everywhere. How am I gonna tie this down? Then there's the side compartments. These doors, not so much. I don't really use this at all. Then let me know if you think of anything I should put there. But I'm very happy with most of it. Now, if you're extra observant, you may have realized this side of the truck is painted primer gray. This side is still bare steel. After I painted the other side, I really disliked it. I like that a lot better. And this primer is slowly turning back into rusted steel anyway. So I'm gonna solve this problem by ignoring it. That should solve itself. It stopped charging, so I tackled the voltage regulator first. And that's all done. Let's see if it works. It worked, kind of, for a while. On this shop truck, I got a few issues I gotta take care of all in this area. I've got the alternator decided to give up its magic smoke the other day, so right now I have no charging system. The AC compressor down there, the whole clutch has fallen off. So the AC doesn't work, so i got to replace that. Also, these motors are known for the killer dowel pin issue, and that means this front cover's got to come off. Now, most of this is pretty routine. There's a bunch of videos out there. I'm not going to bore you with that. Uh, though I did actually watch some myself, and one thing I noticed is removing the fan. Here's the fan. There's the pulley, so he removed this, he removed this, and then he finally got to the bracket in the back. You just undo the bolt, just take the whole bracket off. There's no point in undoing any of the uh, front stuff, just take the bracket off and everything else comes with it. Save a little time by looking ahead. There's the infamous killer dowel pin. Uh, it looks fine. A lot of people will sell you tabs and things that go in this bolt hole and cover up the pin, which is fine, but it's overkill. So we take just a regular center punch, and we tap the housing next to it, and see how that indents the material? It pushes some over, and that is called staking. There's a lot of different forms you can take. There's ball stake, there's line stakes, but this is the simplest and easiest. Usually you don't need this many. I'm just gonna do a few extra. So now the housing is folded over that pin. That's never coming out. It appears the whole front end bowed a little bit when the truck rolled over. The old hood bowed with it, but the new one doesn't quite fit. So I'm going to need to adjust this downwards slightly. I can actually feel a little depression with my fingers, so that should be perfect. That's a lot better. New AC compressor, new alternator, and all back together. The speedometer on this truck was bouncing around, and then the odometer was working on and off. I looked for the speedometer on eBay, but I came up with a bunch of people selling replacement gears. I'm assuming these will fix the problem. I'm just gonna figure out where to put them. Taking the dash apart was easy enough, but now I'm trying to get into the speedometer. It looks like there's three wire connectors. I took an old flathead screwdriver, made it into a mini pry bar. To see if that can get in there and actually get that connector apart. There we go. Now let's see what we got. Gotta get this needle off. 
I'm going to see if this might work. There we go. That looks like the gear I bought and I can see a lot of cracks in it. Basically just touched it and it came right off. And that small gear, whoops, lost it. And that little gear is missing a bunch of teeth. So I think I just found the source of my problem. Now all I have to do is install these new gears and then remember how all this went back together. The little gears are in, the motor's back in, and most of it's together. Now I gotta put this needle back on. Wonder where we should start. Now it seems to have a stop that it goes down to, so that'll be our initial state. I should have paid attention to exactly where it was. I think it was somewhere around the beginning of the speedometer. Press it in place, get it wrong, try again, and hopefully that'll be right. I was about to say this is going smoother than I expected, and then realized I forgot a piece. It's a block off plate to cover up where the park reverse drive thing isn't since it's a manual transmission. Probably don't even need it, but I'll see if I can sneak it in there. And it goes right there. While I have the dash apart, I think it's time for a radio upgrade. This one works on both AM and FM. The display goes on and off, sometimes goes completely blank. Sometimes you have to tap the volume knob a little bit to get it to keep playing. So I'm going to do an upgrade. And I even happen to have one sitting on the shelf. This one has AM, FM, and a cassette player. So this will be a big upgrade. Just got to undo the two screws on the face here. Plugs are out. Ground wire next. Since this is a Chrysler product too, plugs go straight in. I think this came from a Grand Cherokee. Somewhere in the early 90s, I think. Let's see if it works. Oh, turns on. That's a good sign. The volume appears to be just on and off. Not sure if that's an upgrade. I actually can't remember the last time I changed the oil filter on this. I know it's been years. This filter is pretty big and I don't want the engine to have to fill it up with the oil pump. So I'm going to pre-fill it. Now there's oil you can see through and that way I know it's safe. This truck is a problem that really concerns me and it's right here. Notice this wet oily area over here. That entire brake drum and the entire inside of the rim and a good part of the tire are all soaked in gear oil. Seeing a little bit of glitter here and there coming through the oil. At least it's only a little bit. I'm sure that's not bad. Just a little oily in there. That is a very big chunk of metal. Globs of grease. Here's some more metal. There's a lot of chunks of things in here. That cable used to attach to something. It's not quite to the rivets yet, but really close. Lots of grease in here. Originally I thought this had just rusted off whatever it was. It appears goopy with dirt. Looks like it might be the arm that adjusts this self-adjuster here. Something like that. But this is the bit of spring that used to hold it together. Doesn't look like it holds anymore. Now I've got another one of these rear ends, so let's see if that's how that one goes together. I pull this out of my spare rear end pile. That's how this all goes together. Seems like there might be a piece of the spring missing. That could be the cause of a lot of this, but not the major issue. Now the major issue is a level of gear oil that's pouring into the brakes. And there is a wheel seal here, and that's probably bad. I could put a new wheel seal in, and I could get the new hardware and put new pads in and get this all fixed up. But instead, I'm just going to put it back together as is. Now this might seem like an unusual thing to do. This axle has a 410 ratio. But around here, the interstates have a 75 mile an hour limit. And if you try to do that, this motor is tapped out. It's hitting the governor at 2500 RPM or so. They seem to be happier in the 2100 RPM range. Now that I know I'm going to be driving for hours at a time on an interstate, I don't want to be running this engine at max RPM. I'd rather run a little lower. And this axle won't do it. 
I'm gonna button this thing all back up and leave this as a problem for future me. I'm sure future me will thank me for this. Now this axle that we looked at the brake parts on has a 354 ratio, and that's what I want. This one even has complete hardware too. This drum has been turned to the maximum diameter. There's still a little groove, but it's not bad, so we're just gonna ignore that. Now what I am gonna do is put in new bearings. Now these new races need to be pressed in. They make special tools for it. I don't have one. What I do have is the old race that came out. So I'm gonna use this as a drift to press the new one in. Key thing when you do that is make sure you take down the diameter of the old one so you don't get this one stuck in too. You can grind it away with a belt sander or a grinder or whatever you have. When you're putting pressure on one side like I'm doing, you gotta keep moving around. You don't wanna go in at an angle. You can kind of feel around anywhere it looks like it's high, hit that side down. You can always hear when it bottoms out because a hammer sounds different. I hang on to these so if I ever run into the same size bearing again, I've got a driver pre-made. It's good to hoard stuff. I actually know a little bit of the history of this axle, which is handy. It's from a three-quarter ton, and that side has had the brakes redone. And better yet, the previous owner gave me the new brake shoes that never got installed on that side. So I'm gonna go ahead and pop these in there. Now these pads are a little bit worn, so they are worth replacing. And that's where the groove in the drum came from. That one's actually above the surface. That's what the spring's supposed to look like. My old axle was missing that spring part and this whole arm. That caused my problem. Well, one of them. Now as I take off hardware, I've been transferring it to the new shoes. And you want to make sure you get the right thing in the right hole. Now this is definitely not a necessary step, but I'm going to go ahead and replace these wheel cylinders. I hope to never take this apart again. I pulled out my old shop manual. So I wanted to know the torque for setting the wheel bearings, and I found an issue. According to this manual, they say to pack the bearings before installation. These full floating hubs run in oil. And from what I understand, grease and gear oil aren't really compatible. So I went to the all-knowing internet and went through a few forums to see what people said you should do. Strangely enough, no one seemed to agree. There's one group of people that said, always pack them with grease, you're an idiot if you don't do that. And there's another group of people that said, never pack them with grease. You're an idiot if you do that. I'm getting the impression that as long as you have some kind of lube on these, it's probably okay. And eventually it's going to get the oil out of the axle anyway. A little while back, I rebuilt a transmission that you haven't seen yet because I haven't gotten around to installing it. But I use this assembly goo because this stuff is supposed to act like grease. But then as soon as gear oil hits it, it dissolves right into it and it works fine. So I'm going to put a coating of this stuff on these bearings. And that way they'll have lube on them till the oil gets to them. Personally, I still think the dunking in gear oil would have been fine, but this is a lot less messy. As the rollers turn around, you can see some of that assembly lube is now on the bottom side of the roller. So uh, it's definitely got a coating on it. I don't know if this is a good idea or a bad idea, but I'm gonna try it and I'll learn something. And I always like learning something. Now time for a new seal. Make sure the pointy part points in so it keeps all the oil in there. Using my old race as a driver for this one too since it just happens to be the right diameter. There we go. Now I'm going to take a quick measure of my drum. And now I can use that as a rough number to approximate my brake adjustment. That way I'll be pretty close before I put it together. Manual says to torque this to 120 to 140 foot-pounds while turning the drum. So I set the wrench for 130. And we're spinning the whole axle over. I wonder if they expect you to do this while it's attached to the vehicle. I stand on the pinion and then torque it. Maybe this will work. How am I supposed to turn it at the same time? How many limbs do they think people have? All right, we'll alternate turning and torquing. There we go. Now we're supposed to back it off one third of a turn. It is making it fall off the pallet. All right. There we go. Quarter. Uh, that looks like a third, roughly. That oh, feels good. Now the end play is supposed to be one and eight thou. I could feel just a tiny bit, so I'm gonna call that good. You could measure it if you wanted to, but eh, we don't worry about that right now. I can drop this axle in place. 
And all I have to do is bolt it down, which is a problem because I lost the bolts. I don't know where I put them. Luckily, this is part of my spare axle pile. So I'm going to steal bolts out of this and finish putting that one together. Whenever I find the other ones, I'll put them in this one. There's four from that side. And four from this side. Axle's still usable at half power. I'm going to do a little dab of Loctite. Hopefully this works as a thread sealant and a locking compound. Because they definitely had some kind of goop on them before. I was working on sorting out the lines and stuff. And I noticed this one got smashed. Probably when it was removed from the truck. That Dana 60 looks like it has the same line. Close enough. We'll steal that one. This one's already missing the other side line. So no one will notice this one being gone. Except for me when I need it. I'm sure future me will be happy with this too. This whole time I've been working on this axle, I've been debating taking this back cover off. I could drain out the old fluid and see what condition everything's in, but then I'd know what condition everything's in. And if there's a problem in here, I might feel obligated to fix it. It's a lot easier to ignore if you don't know about it. Since I'm going to be taking fairly long trips with this, I probably should know now rather than on the side of the road. Well, I don't see water. That's good. Doesn't look that bad. We're gonna call this totally fine. Well, I mean, a little bit of rust here and there, but rust will wear off as you use it. I don't see anything major, so we're putting this back together and putting some new oil in it. I'm fitting this line from the Dana 60 onto this Dana 70, and it doesn't fit right. That's less than a finger length here between the spring pad and the backing plate. This one is a whole hand length almost. So there is way more distance between the spring and the brake drum on the 60 than there is on the 70. The brake drum is pretty flush with the mounting surface. This one, the wheel mounting surface, is actually quite a bit out of the brake drum. wonder if that's so this could fit dual wheels better. Now according to the book, it takes seven pints of fluid. I've got a fresh gallon here. I'm just going to pour most of it in. And that's probably about right. It's a lot easier my back to lift an axle from a little bit higher than ground level. That makes things better. The pigment kept dragging in, so I gave it a sled. It's good to keep old cookware lying around. I already had this axle fall off these jacks once, so, oh, there, it just dropped in. So always keep your hands up on the top, make sure no part of your body is below, so if it falls, you don't get squished. Now I'm using a jack on either side to try to maneuver into place, moving them a little at a time. Again, trying not to get squished. There we go, I think it just dropped in. Now I've got the axle in place, I'm gonna go ahead and attach it. This is a factory mount, U-bolts, where the spring went through, and a plate on the bottom. Places that sell U-bolts say you have to replace them every single time you change them. I don't believe that at all. I reuse U-bolts a lot. However, this truck spent quite a few years in New England with salted roads. Where the U-bolt was sitting in that hole, they're rusted pretty badly and a smaller diameter than they used to be. In some places, the threads are completely rusted off. Also, these plates have a fair amount of rust on them too. Now this Dana 60 that I kept stealing parts off of, came out of a truck that I tore down for parts. Even though the truck was completely coated inside and out with all sorts of rodent droppings, there wasn't much rust. Save the mounting hardware too. Now these U-bolts look fine and I could reuse these, but they're too long because it's from a 4x4 truck that had a spacer. So I can't use these. The plates on the bottom are in real nice shape. So I am going to steal those. Since I thought I was going to reuse the U-bolts and didn't intend to replace them, I didn't go ahead and order any. So I had to go with what was available locally, which is not good. You can tell these are a lower quality U-bolt. They didn't come with self-locking nuts, they came with lock washers. But I was able to go up a size. 
These are 5 8 inch cue bolts. The original ones were 9 16 So hopefully the larger diameter makes up for the lower quality. And that means these don't fit because that plate was drilled for 9 16 So I'm just gonna run a 5 8 drill bit through these holes. Now let's do the safety warnings, blah, blah, blah. Make sure everything's clamped down properly and so it doesn't spin around on you. What I am gonna do is just grab these by hand and shove them into the drill bit. Luckily I know how much torque this drill has and it's not that much. Someday I'm gonna replace the belt on this. There we go. Then I'm gonna make them a little oversized by tilting the plate. That'll give me a little wiggle room for misalignment. I'm pretty sure this is not the way you're supposed to operate a drill press. This is probably the kind of thing they'd have the red circle, the slash through it, telling you not to do this. All done. Never even needed to use the vice once. That saves time. The holes don't line up at all. I'm just gonna use a clamp to make them fit. This will hold them in place and make it easier to get it started. This tool has a little more power. Yep, bolt sticking through. When in doubt, go with something steel. Keep running out of travel in my socket. I can't turn it any further than that. I'm just trimming off the excess as I go. And that leaves a good sized stud left over for putting in my bolt drawer. Out of travel again. Now I can go further. That's good enough for now. Once I get the weight on the truck, I'll actually torque them with a breaker bar or maybe a torque wrench. Oh, these shocks are still good. Put them on like a year ago. Let me show you what the old shocks looked like. So these are the shocks that have been on here for about since the last century. They don't really work. Now that I figured out the technique on the first side, the second side is going a lot smoother. I put one all the way down, the other one I left way up, using the chain type vice grips to squeeze those together so I can get the plate on the first one and have the nuts in place there. Now I'm going to switch this vice grip over to this side, then tap this side down. A little tapping, a little wiggling. There we go. That went way smoother on the other side. Apparently you learn things as you go. Look at all these goodies left over. I'm down to just installing the tires. This hub's the one I use that assembly lube on. So right now all that oil that I put in the differential housing is oozing its way in and filling every nook and cranny of those bearings. We can give it a little bit of a spin every once in a while. Make sure that gear oil goes everywhere. Now this is the side that already had the brakes done before I got the rear axle. So in theory, I shouldn't need to take this apart. One of the studs is broken off, but the other seven look good. Every once in a while, I hear a little scraping on the drum and the emergency brake doesn't work on this side. None of that seemed particularly important, so I went ahead and put the tire on. I'm gonna to torque these things down and get them where they should be. Now the book says they're supposed to be 150 to 210 foot pounds, and I know that's wrong. Because I went to the bigger size U-bolt, they have a different pitch on the threads. And the pitch of the threads gives you a different ratio between your rotation and your linear pull. And a finer thread will give you more clamping force with the same amount of torque. So I know what I'm about to do is wrong, but I'm going to ignore that. It's probably close enough. The brakes were super spongy at first. But if I pumped them, they kind of worked. That pedal is seriously spongy, so we'll let them bleed a little bit. Better. But not good. I kind of roughly adjusted the shoes, but never really got them right. So I'm going to see if just adjusting it will take care of the issue. Oh, 
And I happened to run into the guy I got this axle from today. He had redone the brakes on this side nine years ago. So there's a possibility there might be an issue here. And it is apparently way out of adjustment. There's a good possibility this is what was causing my low brake pedal. I broke down and read the manual again. Apparently, these rear wheel analog brake trucks have a valve up here. Then that needs to be bled first before you do the rear wheels. So let's try doing it the way I was supposed to do it. I'm gonna make myself a proper brake bleeding tool. I've got a clear jar and I popped a hole in the lid. A Little bit of thin tubing that's too small, but what I had around. An old piece of fuel line to adapt that to the right size. So one end of the small tubing goes inside the bit of fuel line and that should go on our actual brake bleeder. Then the other end of the tubing goes on the hole, the top of the jar, and you want this down all the way to the bottom. That way it doesn't ever pick up air, it just is always in fluid. The bleeder's cracked, fuel line shoved over the end, and fluid is starting to come down the tube. Now I got the system moved over to a wheel cylinder. The results were disappointing. The speedometer's back to working. Registered almost 0.3 miles, driving back and forth in the driveway testing the brakes. Now I'm sure I've got all the air out of this brake system but it still doesn't feel right. There is a possibility this unit went bad. Because when it senses the rear wheels locking up, it has a piston that moves and it reduces the rear wheel pressure. Now that just starts moving all the time. It lets the pedal go down a lot further before you feel any brakes, which is what I've got going on right now. I've got to take that cap off the end. Now there's supposed to be a light spring in here. The truck's off, we're stationary. There's no reason for the ABS to kick on, so that piston should not move. We're gonna go hit the pedal and see what happens. I didn't see any movement at all. I figured I'd add the spring to see if that made it more obvious. I'm gonna hit the pedal and see if that thing moves. I didn't see it move at all. It looks like that might still be okay. Even though I never touched the front brake system, I'm gonna go ahead and bleed those too. The fluid in the front system was a little bit dirtier. But bleeding didn't help at all. I'm running out of options as to what's wrong and to why these brakes don't work. I'm still suspicious of that anti-lock valve. I really want to bypass that safety feature for safety. But before I do that, I'm going to look behind drum number two. I'm going to see what's in this drum that I haven't taken apart yet. The first thing I notice is the little key that's supposed to hold this nut from turning is missing. So I'm already glad I took this off. That spring is not attached. The pads, there's some bluing on the metal where the metal was hitting the drum. This drum is roasted. It's got metal flake dust in here. There's a little pad left right there. Now we're back to the old axle. Let's see what it looks like inside this one. The shoes are too tight, I can't slide the drum off. I'm gonna use one screwdriver to push away the self-adjusting lever. I'm going to use that little pry bar one I made for the speedometer deal to turn the adjuster. That's definitely the right tool for the job. Everyone needs a little mini pry bar. Well, now that doesn't look half bad. All sorts of shiny new hardware. The solution is obvious now. We'll take everything all at once. All I have to do is undo the emergency brake. Take off the brake line, undo four bolts, and all this bad brake stuff can go away. That is a pretty impressive wear on those brake pads. Then we just put on the new to us, well, I guess it's not new to me because it's off the old axle, but new to this axle with some shiny bit hardware. Now we just bolt this in place and all our problems should be solved. Apparently I didn't need to remove the emergency brake cable, at least not this end, because this one that came with this axle is frozen solid. I had to go pull the one off the other axle that works, and so I'm gonna put it right back into the backing plate it came out of. 
Now we're going to make sure everything is like new here. At least close enough. Those shiny bits are getting a little shinier. That's a lot easier to do with the axle attached to the vehicle. One third. Look for our one to eight thou end play. If I can feel it, we got at least a thou. I assume the axle have the same number of splines. Let's compare. Well, this one on the bottom is the axle shaft that came out of the 1990 truck. This top one is the 1993 rear end, which is the one I have in here now. And it looks like the newer one is slightly smaller. So, the newer axle shaft goes in. I did not know they were different. I'm learning lots with this project. There we go. Now, as an added bonus here, by swapping the whole hub and drum around, I gained an extra lug nut. The other hub only had seven studs. This one has eight. Seven out of eight is 87.5%. That's a B plus, so that's pretty good on wheel retention. But now that I have all eight, I think I'm giving it an A. They work. That's what it's supposed to be like. It is so nice to have good brakes again. Oh, that is way better. Let's take this thing for a test drive. Got a GPS with me. I know the speedometer is wrong having changed the rear ratio. We'll see what it is. Seems good. No weird noises, no weird vibrations. Now, the speedometer says I'm doing 30. GPS says 35. Well, 34.6, but close enough. I've got to add to my list of stuff to do to get rid of that light. Set. Huh. It dims with the gauge dimming. Huh. Well, if I need to add aftermarket gauges, there's my power source already. Maybe I'll uh, do a little rewiring there. Oh, brakes feel nice. It's like right near the top. Perfect. All right, taking off in second with a higher ratio. Still no problem. Give the undercar camera something to look at. There we go. There's a cloud of smoke. Looks like it's going to be a nice sunset, too. Another stop sign. And we're just slowing right down. Tell me how much you appreciate brakes after not having them.
Sorry, it shifts the camera backwards. This truck's not slow, not fast. video. There's some big improvements in the drivability of this truck. It'll cruise at speed a lot better. I'll actually know what speed I'm going and the oil will stay in the rear end. The brakes seem to work great and I can start using this to haul stuff. There's still a few more things I want to do. Some stuff I didn't quite finish and I came up with a few ideas while I was working on it of improvements I want to make. So for now I'm going to put this truck to work but you will see it again in another video. One question I have for you. Do you think I should paint it? And if so what color? I didn't like the gray. Maybe silver? Or is that too much of one color? If you could let me know in the comments, I'd sure appreciate that. So now I get to go have fun hauling junk, and I hope you guys are having fun too. We'll see you next time. I'm putting all these old parts back together. Because while future me might not like the condition of things, at least I'll have all the hardware. 